There was an article written some years ago called um, Compassion Pre-Evangelism, the Master Key to the Town. I don't really like the term pre-evangelism that well because I think that we do compassion just because it's the compassionate thing to do. I do think it will open up doors to share the gospel. But be that as it may, I think he had some very good principles here on doing compassion ministry. Now, keep in mind, if you are a church plant, you're, you're a small church. You're not going to be a big church. And so your resources are usually pretty limited. You may have some partners from another church that can come and help you, but for the most part, you have very limited amount of time and energy. And most of the energy is probably going to be put into more directly evangelistic types of activities and, and making disciples. And um, so many times a church plant doesn't get involved in very much in terms of compassion type ministry. But I do think it's important. And it's a manifestation of the love of Christ. We said, remember, a kingdom community has three dimensions. Worship, evangelism, discipleship, and the third one was compassion, the love of Christ showing it in our communities. And so I think it is good for a church plant to have compassion ministry. It's important, and yet you have to go about it in a way that's careful and well thought through. He says, work from an established nearby church. Well, if you're a church plant, it's, you, know, you may be the established church, but you may be able to cooperate with others as well. But it is good to have the church as sort of a base, a spiritual base, because compassion ministry, if you're working with the poor, if you're working with needy people, if you're doing hospital visitation, it can be very draining also spiritually. And so you need that spiritual core. They say, find the most significant need that you can address. Now, when you begin to discover and more about your community, you may find all kinds of needs. I was, when I was planning a church in the Chicago area, it was a growing community, and I was going around literally knocking on doors and sort of asking people, what could a church do in this community, and what are some of the needs of the community? People were saying things like, well, the traffic is terrible here. We need wider streets. Well, church is not going to go into uh, you know, widening the roads so that there's not so many traffic jams. That's not a need you're going to meet. Or there may be other needs that are just way beyond what a church, especially a new church plant, could ever address. Now, he gives an example of sort of a drug education ministry. Uh, they weren't in a position to have a whole rehabilitation program. That, that's huge. But to have education about drugs, drug abuse, what parents can do, uh, this was a, a need they discovered in the community. There were a lot of young people that were getting involved with drugs. And parents, of course, were very concerned about this didn't know what to do. And so, no, we can't have a drug rehab center. That would be beyond our means. But we could do drug education. And so that became a venue, an avenue, for a church to address a need where Christ is concerned about people getting involved with drugs, isn't he? And to be able to address that need that even a non-Christian would say, that's something important. Christians are good people that are here to help. And so that was one example of that. Get involved in the community problem personally. In other words, what they were saying is if you have something like this, don't address the problem from a purely theoretical point of view. Meet people who are affected by this. Get to know them. Hear their story. Weep with those who weep. Get to meet that young person whose life is being destroyed by drugs. Get to meet those parents whose hearts are totally broken and you begin to relate to the issue at a personal level instead of at a sort of a mechanical, theoretical level of how do we fix this. He says, don't offer so-called homegrown answers to the needs. In other words, you need to have good, if possible, professional way to address that need. Um, if you are just sort of guessing uh, you, you may not be doing very much helpful. You may even be hurting. And in fact, in this case, say with a drug education, you may not have a drug addictions expert in your church. You probably don't. But you could invite somebody in. Maybe there's a Christian who is an expert in this field from somewhere else. You invite them to come and to speak to this. Maybe you can even invite a person who's not a Christian, but they could speak to this need and, and it would be helpful. I know of one church 
This was in Germany and there was a very uh, uh, famous case of a school child who'd been kidnapped. The school child was, I think on the way home from school, was kidnapped. And uh, it was quite a sensation in the media, the newspapers, television, everybody was talking about this. And parents became terrified. You know, what about my child walking home from school? Is my child safe? How do I protect my child? And even though it was a very, very rare sort of occurrence, nevertheless, parents become concerned. And this, this was such a concern, the church said, look, here's, here are people that are really upset. Let's have an information night in our church. It's not going to be an overt evangelistic event. We're not going to share the gospel in that event. But let's just open up the church as a meeting place. Let's invite community experts. Let's invite the local police to come and give information to parents about, you know, best way to protect your children and so on. Or maybe somebody from the local school to come in and say, you know, what do we need to teach our children about, you know, not going with strangers. Or, and so they actually just had people from the community that wasn't particularly Christian per se. But what did that church do? They showed the community we care. We care about what you care about because Christ cares about what you care about. Christ cares about your children. And if a secular police officer or a secular school official can give you helpful information, that's fine. Another thing it did, by the way, is it brought people into that church building that may have never darkened the door of a church. But they came in and they said, you know what, these are friendly people here. This is not a scary place. Some people are literally scared to enter into a church building. You know, I grew up as an atheist. I, I'd never been to church. Church was kind of a spooky place. And uh, I had Catholic friends, and they'd tell me all these sort of spooky things that sort of happened in the church, and that was kind of creepy. Um, but, or, or sometimes people say, oh, it's a sin to enter a, a Protestant church or something like that. So sometimes it's just getting people in the building and, and just being friendly people and saying, yeah, we're here for the community. It's okay. We're not isolating ourselves. So that's, a, that's another thing there. But get, get good information to really help meet that need, whatever that need is. It says network with those already trying to meet the need. So maybe with this drug education program, you network with the local schools. You network maybe with the police department. Um, you find those in the community. Uh, maybe they're not Christians, but they're doing a good thing. And you as a Christian can be salt in that program. In fact, especially something like drug rehabilitation programs, they uh, advocate the 12-step program, which has spirituality in it. You have to call on a higher power to receive help to overcome your addictions. And actually, I've started volunteering at a drug rehabilitation center for teenagers. It's not a particularly Christian place. But the spiritual element of that program is very central. Why not bring Christ into that kind of a context? And um, so network with those who are tra already trying to meet the need. Use first-rate publicity, in other words, People should take you seriously. I think that's what he's getting at here. Um, if you have just sort of slipshod, not very good materials, people are nowadays, this day and age, they won't take you very seriously. Uh, he says, enlist local government and business support. You'd be amazed sometimes for some of these programs that even secular businesses are willing to sponsor a program, even a Christian program, a religiously based program, because they see that it's gonna meet a need. Kind of along a slightly different line, I know of one church that had an art exhibition. They had Chagall paintings or, or watercolors. Um, one of the, uh, I believe it was a niece of, of this, the famous artist Chagall, uh, was a Christian, and she would go and do art exhibitions in churches. And of course, Chagall had biblical paintings. He had paintings of biblical motifs, and she would tell the biblical stories. It was a great sort of art education as well as evangelism because these are biblical stories. And uh, in one situation, a local bank helped finance, sponsor the art exhibition in that town. And so it was a good way to build relations in the community. School groups came in and said, wow, an art exhibition in our community, a smaller community, doesn't have big art museums. Um, wow, that's, very, that's really good for our school kids to have, be exposed to that. They even had programs where kids could paint and all kinds of creative things to do. And so here again, cooperating with the schools, cooperating with local businesses, and uh, you build goodwill in the community. Do not use for direct evangelism. 
Now here's where, you know, some people will say, well, if you can't preach the gospel, you shouldn't really be wasting your time with it. And I say, you know, the love of Christ compels us to care about people. And if we use a lot of these kinds of ministries as bait, in other words, let's, let's get them in the room by offering a drug education program, and then we'll talk for 15 minutes about drug education, and then we'll talk for 15 minutes about Jesus. How do you think people feel? They feel tricked. I mean, wouldn't you feel that way? If you were invited to something that was supposedly just an information and then somebody was trying to feed you something else. And so that's, I don't think that's a, a it's a question of integrity. Um, I think we can be kind. I think we can do it in the name of Jesus. We might say something like, say like with a drug program, you know, this is not the place to preach, but I can tell you that Jesus Christ has made a difference in people's lives. And if you want to know more about that, talk to me later or come to this other event. But be careful about using Compassion Ministries as sort of bait to get people to come and hear your message. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the Kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Now, in many cultures, people consider spirituality integral to a holistic view of life. In Western cultures, we tend to divide things out more. I think of one example in Africa where there were two medical clinics. One was a totally secular NGO. Uh, there were no spirituality to it. It was just give the medicine and so on. The other clinic was run by Christians. And so when they gave out their medicines or, or diagnosis, they would pray for the patients. And it was interesting, more people went to the Christian one where they got prayed for, even though many of the people were not Christians. And they began to ask around. They said, well, we believe that life is holistic and so prayer, spiritual, yes, we want a spiritual answer to our health, not just medicine. And so many people see life more holistically, and so it's very natural to have a spiritual dimension to addressing these, these issues we may be addressing. But we do need to be very sensitive about it. And then to pray consistently and realizing that God it has to be the one that works in the hearts of people and that God is concerned about whatever this particular issue is we're addressing also. And then finally, being willing to work over the long haul. Don't start something you really can't finish. Now, if you're just doing one information evening on how to help children, uh, keep your children safe or something like that, or I gave the example before of potty training. Somebody asked me, well, how do you make that transition from potty training to the gospel? Well, you probably don't. <laughs> Although there are some parallels of helping new Christians like babies. Uh, there's a little potty training involved with new believers learning how to live as Christians, I suppose. Um, but, um, you know, you probably won't. Um, so there, there can be certain punctual events that you do that don't require long-term. But if you're going to get involved in long-term work, you do need to carry through and not quit in the middle. We were involved in refugee work uh, in the community where we were working in Neumarkt, in, in the first German church we were involved in planting. There were refugees from Africa. There were refugees from Iran. And so we would go and do visits. We'd do services with them. We helped them get food. We helped them care for some of their physical needs that they had. It was a great way to just show the love of Christ to people who were in a difficult situation and, and the church was serving the community in that way as well. And by the way, the community was not very friendly to most of those refugees either. And so it was a great ministry, but you had to be in it for the long haul. Well, those are just some guidelines for um, working with uh, compassion types of ministries, community service type ministries.